Hi, I'm Jared Gardner, and I'm here today to talk about an unusual and rare soft tissue tumor called ossifying fibromyxoid tumor of soft parts. That's a lot of syllables to say, so we abbreviate this as OFMT. Uh, OFMT is uh, pretty uncommon, and it's a really distinct tumor, so it's, a worth, it's worthwhile to know about, and it um, often presents in the subcutis, um, and uh, most often in the lower extremity. The thigh is the most common site, as for many soft tissue tumors. And a lot of times this tumor will have been present for many years before it's finally biopsied and diagnosed. Uh, most of them appear to have an indolent behavior, although they can recur locally. And there um, are atypical and malignant forms, uh, rarely, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. The most important thing to recognize is that most ossifying fibromyxoid tumors, as suggested by the name, have bone, ossification. And that bone tends to look like this. It tends to be a layer of or kind of a shell or an incomplete shell of peripheral bone around a central um, tumor. And so if you go down here, we'll show you what the tumor cells look like. The tumor cells usually, I'm gonna rearrange my slide here. The tumor cells are usually round to oval and so sometimes spindled, but they're often more round or oval in shape. Ah, sorry. And they're very uniform. They all look very much like their neighbors. And um, that's a clue I, I like to talk about that when you see cells that all look just like each other in a soft tissue tumor, that's oftentimes a clue that the tumor may be a translocation uh, associated tumor because every cell in the tumor has the same molecular abnormality. So they all look the same. Whereas when you see pleomorphic tumors, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times those have multiple gains and losses or aneuploidy. And so there's kind of two different pathways. It's not a hard and fast rule, but it's a pretty nice trick that one of my uh, great mentors, Mark Edgar, uh, taught me, and I found that to be really useful in practice. So you'll see these kind of round to oval um, cells, sometimes spindled cells. They have very bland nuclei. They don't have pleomorphism or much atypia. Sorry, this is a little bit of a thick section. Sometimes sections with bone are a little bit difficult to cut. Let's see if high power will help us. They have really fine, delicate chromatin, kind of pale pale nuclei, and mitotic activity is usually very low. Oftentimes it's uh, it's very, very hard to find mitoses. If you start finding much nuclear atypia, hyperchromatic or pleomorphic nuclei, or if you start finding a lot of mitoses, then you have to worry that you might be dealing with an atypical or a malignant form. And in the uh, comments and the video description down below, I'll include some links to papers a bit that give criteria for how to decide uh, malignancy or atypical uh, features in ossifying fibromyxoid tumor. So again, we have this peripheral shell of bone. Here's the bone. And the central part of the tumor is round, oval, or spindled. And the cells here are kind of arranged in sheets, but if you look back at this other area, you can see from lower power, they have a really distinct pattern where they're arranged in kind of these long rows, cords, we call that, cords or trabeculae. The background can range from fibrous to myxoid, as the name suggests, and it's very, it's highly variable. Sometimes they're very dense pink sclerotic collagen in the background. Other times it's really abundant blue myxoid material in the background. Um, so I'll show an example of that in a minute too. So whenever you see kind of uh, cords or rows or chains of spindle or round cells in soft tissue pathology, there's a handful of things I think of. Ossifying fibromyxoid tumor is one of them. Myoepithelial tumors uh, often make cords and chains. Um, epithelioid hemangioendothelioma, an unusual vascular tumor, does that same pattern. And uh, also uh, you can see it in um, <clears throat> chordomas, which usually occur in the spine or around the spine, but rarely can occur in the soft tissue as well. And so those are things that I always like to keep in mind in my differential when I see cords and chains of cells in a soft tissue tumor. So that's a nice classic example. Let me show you uh, some more. And unfortunately, some of these slides are a bit faded, but hopefully they'll still be good enough. So this tumor, again, you can really appreciate the cords and chains of cells. They're really kind of weaving around one another here, and they have a really dense hyalinized background that almost looks like osteoid in this case. It's a very dense sclerotic collagen background. And just like the last case I showed you, the cells tend to be very, very pale and kind of uniform, low mitotic activity. 
and you can see a little bit of areas here with a little bit of bluish um, beginning of a mixoid background in here. So another example of ossifying fibromyxoid tumor. And uh, looking around this one, let's go back to lower power. Ah, here's a little bit of bone. So there's a tiny little couple spicules of bone here out at the edge. But really, it, it, most of the tumor lacks bone. And so the, even though the name suggests that they should be ossifying, uh, about 80%, if I recall, you know, a majority of the tumors do have a peripheral shell of bone, but certainly a subset of tumors lack any bone at all. And so it's good to recognize this kind of cords and chains pattern and think about ossifying fibromyxoid tumor, um, even if there's no bone present, either in the biopsy that you have, or even if you have an excision, if there's no bone, that's okay. It can still be ossifying fibromyxoid tumor. Sometimes they lack uh, that bony shell around them. Um, if you have a radiograph uh, report, uh, sometimes that can be helpful, especially if you're looking at like a needle biopsy and then the radiograph suggests that there's a shell of bone um, or a partial shell of bone or calcification, that can be a useful clue. Now here's an example that looks quite different than the others I showed you. It's very blue and mixoid. So sometimes they are very fibrous, other times they're very mixoid, but you can still see how the cells are, are arranged in these kinds of cords and chains. And you know, a very mixoid tumor like this could lead you to think about things like mixoid liposarcoma. But one big difference is that in mixoid liposarcoma, although it does have small uniform cells because it's also a translocation associated tumor, it doesn't tend to make cords or chains. The cells in mixoid liposarcoma are very, they respect their neighbors. They're very spread out. They don't touch one another or hook up with one another in little rows. So when you see a mixoid tumor with kind of round to spindled cells that are uh, arranged in little rows or chains like you're seeing here, that's usually not going to be a mixoid liposarcoma. Sarcoma. Of course, you can use molecular um, uh, uh, testing if you're struggling. So here's an example of a much more a much more mixoid ossifying fibromyxoid tumor. And I'm not I can't remember if this one had any bone around it or not. Let's look. Oh, and look, this is a good example too. That in the same tumor, sometimes you can merge from areas that are very mixoid to areas that begin to look a lot more fibrous. And here you can also appreciate that the cells are a little less round and more spindled in this zone. So you really can have a lot of variability in this tumor. And that's part of what makes the diagnosis a little challenging is when they don't have the classic features uh, with the bone around them. Sometimes uh, you you can really struggle with deciding how to classify these. So immunohistochemistry is, it can be helpful here, but it's a little tricky because these tumors are usually S100 positive. So it's important to not mistake them for a nerve sheath or melanocytic neoplasm. But more importantly than just S100 positive, they often express Desmond as well, about half of cases. So if Desmond's negative, that doesn't mean it's not an ossifying fibromyxoid tumor. But if you have S100 and Desmond co-expression, that's a very unusual pattern of co-expression. And it should always make you think about this tumor, I think. And occasionally there can be actin, even sometimes keratins, glial fibrillary acidic protein, GFAP. If I recall, neurofilament can sometimes be positive. So they have, I think some authors, I believe it was Andrew Fulp has described this as a, a scrambled immunophenotype where you have kind of this hodgepodge of different stains that don't seem to go together well and don't seem to make sense. Um, you know, they, like what kind of tumor has S100, which is a neural or neural crest marker, and Desmond, which is uh, um, a smooth muscle or a smooth or skeletal muscle marker. So it's kind of weird to have all of these immuno uh, stains together um, being expressed in the same uh, tumor cells. So it's kind of an unusual tumor. We're not really sure what the cell of origin is or what kind of cell this is differentiating. Like it's probably its own unique cell type, I imagine, like is the case with many different types of translocation tumors. But again, a nice example of the cords and chains in the mixoid background here. Here's another example. And again, unfortunately, this is very pale and washed out both from time and also from a bit of decalcification. But the reason I'm showing this one is you can see that the bone, there's a little bone around the periphery. Here it is. Here's a little bit of that bone shell, but also you can have some nodules of bone or calcification that get more towards the center of the tumor. Sometimes you can even see nodules of cartilage um, in, the, in the middle of the tumor too. But when we go down and look closer, we can see these cells, just like the other cases I showed, round, uniform, pale chromatin, low mitotic activity, ossifying fibromyxoid tumor of soft tissue. Now, I mentioned that there can be malignant forms. They're quite rare. I've seen a few, um, but they and they can behave aggressively in those cases. 
Um, and uh, some, uh, the WHO mentions that at least some authors have, have used, uh, have considered um, nuclear atyp marked nuclear atypia or hypercellularity plus the presence of at least two or more, um, I think greater than two mitoses per 50 high power fields could be used as a, a criteria for malignancy. And so again, I'll put a link to, to some papers so you can do some additional reading. I imagine these are criteria that may evolve over time. So when you're watching this video, if it's a few years down the road, um, just keep in mind that you know medical knowledge may have changed since the time this video was made in early 2018. So here's, a, here's another ossifying fiber myxoid tumor. You can see the kind of uniform cells, the cords and chains. This one you can see in one field here, both blue myxoid and also pink fibrous backgrounds. But this tumor had, has a catch. It's got other areas that have a much more uh, enlarged atypical nuclei. And I believe right down here there was a little nodule. Definitely this is much more atypical, enlarged hyperchromatic nuclei compared to the other things that I was showing you. And this tumor had increased mitotic activity in quite a few mitoses. So this is an example of a malignant ossifying fiber myxoid tumor. And I've seen them metastasize distantly and behave aggressively, but I've also seen cases where patients develop distant metastases, but still lived with repeated metastases over some years. So I think once a patient gets metastases, the course then can be variable. Some patients may have more rapid progression, but others may have a long, long kind of indolent disease process even when they have distant mets. I think this is such a rare tumor that we still don't really have a full understanding of how it will always behave even when it's in its malignant form. So this is one example though of a malignant ossifying fiber myxoid tumor. And here's another one, and I think this one's a really, a really great example because it shows, I don't even, I can't go any lower power than this. You can see down here, ignore that this is just some contaminant here, some some skin that fell on the slide during preparation. But here you can see the myxoid background, the very bland, small. By the way, bland means lacking atypia. I use that word a lot, but I guess some people don't, don't use that word very often. But bland means not, not atypical. That's the way I use it. These areas are kind of small spindle to oval cells, vaguely making little chains and cords, not nearly as nice as the previous case, but I think this area looks has a more benign appearance. But then watch as we transition right across over to this area. Here you can see the bone, but this is much more cellular. The cells are very hyperchromatic and much larger, cytologically very atypical. I'm not a cytopathologist, but I think that these look atypical and malignant in my opinion. And then there were, look, even in one field here, we can see, here's a, well, maybe it's not in the field. Here's a mitosis right here. Here's a mitosis right here. I think there's another one right over here. So just in one tiny area, we're already at three mitotic figures. So we have marked atypia, multiple mit mitoses, but you can still see that the in very cellular areas like this with really dramatic nuclear atypia, very large nuclei, very dark and hyperchromatic, much different than the benign cases or the benign looking ones that I showed you earlier. And it seems like the, the tumors that have the benign, and oh, you can even see that there's um, necrosis, tumor cell necrosis here, individual dying tumor cells. So the, the ossifying fiber myxoid tumors that have a benign appearance and, and uh, typical or conventional features, it seems like most of them behave indolently, although they can recur. Um, and there's some debate that maybe occasional ones still could metastasize. So there's some, some uncertainty about that, but I think that most of them will have indolent behavior. When you have um, malignant examples like this though, uh, more aggressive behavior can be seen. So this is a good example of a malignant um, ossifying uh, fiber myxoid tumor. And this was, uh, uh, contributed to my teaching set by my friend Raul Gonzalez. So thank you, Raul, for this really uh, good example to demonstrate. And here's another case that I've seen. And again, a beautiful example of the, or a really, really classic example of the cords and chains, these really elongated or trabeculae, you could even argue that these cells are all kind of arranged together and subdivided by little bands of collagen in between. So very, very corded example and we're down here deep in the near the fascia or the tendon and look what we have right here
This is lymphovascular invasion. So this actually, this particular lesion was actually a metastatic lesion and it had LVI, lymphovascular invasion, right next to it. But you can see a plug of tumor floating in the middle of a lymphatic or vascular channel. And uh, this was a, a malignant ossifying thyroid myxoid tumor uh, that had metastasized. So uh, these are rare tumors, but and they're very unusual, and it's uh, something that's good to know about. Oh, and I think, I can't remember if I mentioned, but I said that these have a rearrangement. The um, uh, most ossifying fibromyxoid tumors have a rearrangement of the PHF1 gene, PHF1, and again, I'll put some links down below that you can do more reading on this. And PHF1 is rearranged in the majority of conventional or um, uh, conventional ossifying fibromyxoid tumors. Interestingly, the malignant um, uh, ossifying fibromyxoid tumors seem to not have that rearrangement as often, and instead they have loss of chromosome 22. So that's kind of unusual and interesting, and uh, the more we study the molecular abnormalities in soft tissue tumors, I think sometimes it answers questions and sometimes it raises more questions in my mind um, of how, how these tumors really work. It's a very unusual and strange world, soft tissue tumors, but hopefully this makes at least one little part of it a little bit more clear to you. Um, please uh, feel free to, to add comments uh, down below or any questions you have, uh, and if you like this video, I'd love for you to give it a like and uh, please subscribe to my channel if you want to be notified about additional teaching videos in the future. Thanks for watching.